Thank you very much, uh, David, for those uh, sometimes kind words uh, of introduction. Uh, members of the judiciary, uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, uh, and friends, I want to express sincere thanks to the Council of Clank for the invitation to address you in the annual Justice Lecture, which is a, uh, an honour and extremely uh, proud to have that bestowed upon me. I'm extremely sorry that Irish Barry uh, is unfortunately not well enough uh, to be here uh, tonight because I know how much this evening means to her and she has for the last seven years as Chief Executive uh, brought this organisation to the incredible uh, strength, position of strength it's in right now and we wish her a very speedy uh, recovery. Um, I want to thank uh, Christopher Bowes and Karen Smith and Julie Kernan for all of their work in assisting me in the preparation for this evening. Dave Ellis, uh, for those of you present who didn't have the pleasure or honour of knowing him, was a pioneer of community legal services uh, in Ireland. Uh, he was for many years the Minister of the Kula Community Law Centre, which was established by Clank in the mid 70s as the first independent law centre providing free legal services in the community. Uh, he was joined there by many committed and historical people that were Ocean Connolly and uh, Judge Colin Daly uh, were with us um, this evening. But Daly played a very lonely furrow in the 70s and the 80s at the cold face of community services. I'm absolutely honoured and touched and delighted, as wife said, uh, is with us uh, here this evening. And um, most importantly, in my book, Dale Ellis was a lot of fun. He was great uh, company. and. It was always a joy to work with him on issues of campaigns, although we did suffer one very horrific blind spot, which was a lifelong support for Shamrock Rovers. <laughs> the picture on the screen I love shows Dave welcoming a client and uh, her baby into the uh, Kula Community Law Centre. But if you look closely at the baby, it looks as if someone has told that child about Dave's support for Shamrock Rovers. It looks a little bit startling to me, and I think that's a convenient thing if you've ever done. When I uh, accepted the invitation uh, that was given to me by Irish to address uh, you this evening, uh, I literally asked her what on earth uh, would, I, uh, would I speak about. And Irish, in her characteristically dippy manner, responded by saying, You've been involved in flight for over 40 years, surely you've learned something about uh, <laughs> So it's with some trepidation that I attempt to distill down some basic lessons that I learned over the last 40 years of being involved in FLAM. Insofar as there is a theme that will run through my remarks, it's literally that for the success of democracy, I do believe that people need to feel included in their society and they need to feel heard in the true sense of that word. Uh, at a basic level, people need to feel that there is respect for them and that that respect will translate into fair treatment in their dealings with others and in their dealings institutions and arms of the state. I believe that people must be entitled to some basic knowledge of the law that governs them, and they must be entitled to have full access to the legal system. We do have a democracy in Ireland that's in better shape than so many other countries uh, in the world, but there is still great inequality in this country, and there are many institutional and legal barriers to realising the true uh, goal of equality before the law in our republic. Insofar as there's an underlying theme that is, I believe, we should never underestimate the importance of any connection that one makes with people who feel isolated or marginalised oh. or impoverished. And that the connections that so many people in this room have made through their involvement with the work of flag and their support for the work of flag uh, should uh, never be underestimated. And if, if there is a lesson I have learned over the last 40 years, in fact, is that you, you can constantly uh, miss that. You can underestimate the importance uh, of every act of support that you provide for people who are on the margins, and that is something that I think I hope will come through in the, in the comments uh, that I propose to make. In the 1970s, Josie Airy, who was a court woman, took a case to the European Court of Human Rights, which found that Ireland was in breach of its obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights in failing to have state funded legal services for her in her legal separation. And FLAC was founded in 1969 by four uh, law students in UCD. 
And what they did was they set up a series of advice clinics throughout the city in the first instance, where people were uh, represented in family law cases, mainly in court. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think they were represented by law students, which is something that simply, simply couldn't happen uh, today for a million uh, reasons. Because the word regulation covers most of them. But back then, uh, students actually represented the clients that came into the, uh, the clinics. The state then, in response to the campaign of flag and the area case, set up in 1980 a state fund legal aid scheme. And it's important uh, for those of you in the room who may not be familiar with this important distinction for me just to explain that the civil legal aid scheme, which is the government funded scheme, is one which employs full time uh, solicitors who provide a service to people who qualify under a means test and the merits test for legal aid. And they work mainly in the area of family law, child care law, and, uh, and international protection. And many of those incredibly committed lawyers who work uh, for the Legal Aid Board, I'm delighted to say, have joined us um, this evening. And that is the government scheme that needs to be not only supported but greatly expanded. It has been underfunded by the section, as you may have seen from some of the uh, pieces that uh, David put up on the screen. Flag, on the other hand, is a non-governmental voluntary organisation and it is and has at its core volunteers, solicitors and barristers who give up their time to provide advice and sometimes representation to people who don't qualify for a government fund and legal services. And it has a head office staff as well that is now staffed with professional uh, lawyers, uh, researchers and uh, advocates and communications experts who provide the very extensive services that FLAC is now very proud to be able to say uh, that it is engaged in. But in the early 1980s, FLAC was at a bit of a crossroads because the scheme had just been established. And the picture there is of a free or very state of the RTB uh, rentals shop. The first thing you say to people of a certain age in the 1970s and the 1980s, many people rented their televisions. <laughs> uh, and that was a shop you went to to rent your television. On the third floor of the OTB rentals, on the extreme left, is a little window, and that is the sole window of the flat office. And that office was opened in 1978. And our colleague at the bar, Jerry Durkin, wrote a letter in 1978 to the uh, papers to declare the opening of the uh, office. And he wrote, We hope that anyone having difficulty in getting in touch with the flat will contact the central office. Unfortunately, we do not have a phone number yet. <laughs> But we expect to get one before Christmas. <laughs> That's fantastic, I guess. You know, of course, the telegrams telling you we have that phone to you by Christmas. <laughs> anyway, in the early 80s, myself, an Irish barrier, and Eamon Conlon was here, and a bunch of others effectively inherited that little office and took over the reins um, of Flan. And there were only two things in the office there was a telephone and a typewriter. And that crossroads that that was at was one whereby it no longer was going to provide representation on the cases, so what was it going to do? Of course, there was still a huge unmet legal need, and uh, we still had thousands of people coming to look for legal advice uh, and assistance. And so we learned to start trying to provide specialised services in areas of law that private um, practitioners rarely provided uh, uh, advice and representation, like social welfare. And so, for example, social welfare law is a very complicated statutory system that regulates the payments that keep people uh, um, alive and, 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 and secure their income. But it's a complicated uh, system, and most lawyers have never attempted to grapple with it. And we suddenly realised that it was something that FLAC had to do, that FLAC volunteers had to do, and that when we uh, worked in that area, it was very important to try to provide basic information to people. And at that time, uh, we moved into an area of uh, connectivity and uh, association with academics, and in particular with Jerry White and Trinity College. And he and Mel Cousins, who worked uh, in FLAC, produced a series of, uh, of social welfare guides over a period of years that really became uh, essential to the uh, um, advice clinics, not only FLAC advice clinics, but advice clinics around the country. Uh, who were absolutely dependent on that kind of um, expert information on what people's legal entitlements were, and it transformed uh, the way in which advice in that utterly 
uh, uncharted territory uh, could ultimately be given. We then were able to move into higher levels of fundraising so that we could start to employ staff, which was a huge move to employ people. We employed the likes of Mel Cousins, of Brian O'Hara, and Sabbath Green, who actually worked in those areas of law and developed uh, an expertise. The social welfare area led us to be able to take test cases. In the 1980s, Mary Robinson led a successful uh, legal team to the European Court of Justice uh, on the issue of equal treatment of married women in the social welfare. Married women were, were paid lower rates of unemployment payments and disability payments to uh, married men and indeed to single women. The European Court of Justice held that to be unlawful and as a result, like then, took a series of subsequent uh, test cases which ultimately led to tens of thousands of women uh, getting back payments to which they never believed or understood they were entitled. And it was in many ways the most beautiful kind of test case in your lawyer because no one had got ill or sick to get the payment. It wasn't compensation for a third country, but it was for families who were dependent on social welfare. It was hard cash. And there is nothing to increase the goodwill that you have as an organisation <laughs> across the country that produce significant checks to families that have not seen significant checks. And those cases did that. It ultimately cost the state between 200 and 300 uh, million uh, and tens of thousands of women benefited. But we, uh, we saw the real benefit there of taking on uh, that type of test case work. Test cases um, don't always work. Spend a lot of your life as a lawyer taking cases that you think might change the law, and it doesn't. You can spend years of your life pushing a rock up a hill, and that rock will come back down and roll over you. But in that instance, uh, it was successful. The typewriter that I referred to uh, was an IBM typewriter at that time because we punched out so many documents off it. And the one thing we learned in that, again, I'm sorry for these are such basic lessons, but you can send off a million press releases. You can send off a million proposals for law reform uh, that are your own opinion as to how the world should be. But by and large, opinions change. And nowadays, I think, in fact, the newspaper is full of opinion, opinion pieces about there. But if you look at social media, uh, it's full of opinion. And the difficulty with social media is people think that a good day is political activism is to express an opinion on social media and then to express it more vehemently and then to express it more extremely. And that seems to constitute political action. What we learn in fact is if you actually sit down and uh, collate the evidence from the cases that are coming into your sector and into your clinics, and you do the hard graft of actually analysing the uh, cases that are in front of you and produce evidence based proposals for reform, you get a much higher chance of being listened to and you have a much higher rate of effectiveness. And we learned that in the 80s, one of the reports that we was based on the evidence that we had uh, coming into the centres and it's a, it's a piece of advice that we still always give to people who want to be active for change that simply asking for it tends not to be successful but if you do some hard graft uh, and you understand that there are no shortcuts in life uh, it's going to be a lot more it's going to be a lot more effective we then were able to move to a splendid new office uh, so William Street, the top two windows there of the Hyder, the Hyder was an amusement arcade for most of the late 2000s, and if you do know about it, you definitely have had a misspecting. <laughs> uh, as to what happened on the other floor, I've seen the more misspecting. The top floor was the flat office. And at that time, we were able to start employing professional staff and we engaged in lobbying. And to move into lobbying for change requires a, a serious and professionalised approach. The lesson that uh, we learned in fact was the approach that I myself adopted in the 1980s was really not the one to follow. In 1984, I was part of the flag delegation to then Minister for Justice Michael Newman. Now in 1984, Michael Newman was known as a no-nonsense law and order and I uh, was part of a delegation that went to, him to make a complaint about the state of uh, government funding for legal aid services. And I went in with a clipboard in my hand and had a sheet on it. 
and on that sheet I had a series of questions. And we were ushered into the room, and Mike and we had sat behind a very large desk in his ministerial office, and he had three very glum-looking elderly male civil servants uh, seated around him. And I thought, uh, saw a space to sit in front of him, and happily chirped my first question in his direction, which was, Minister, do you accept that Ireland remains in clear and flagrant breach of its obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights by its failure to implement a comprehensive scheme of civil labour? There was an incandescence emanating from Michael and Bill. After what seemed like an eternity through completely gritted his teeth, he said to me that he was not there today to answer my questions, but that if he wanted, if I wanted to tell anything about the work of Flag, I now had precisely two minutes in which to do so. <laughs> Undaunted. <laughs>
What we then learned again in an attempt to be professional about strategic planning was to look at the areas of law in which there isn't a need of service, and one of those areas was the area of debt. Indebted people didn't have access to legal services, and solicitors and barristers were not well uh, placed to provide uh, a useful uh, service because they were very unaccustomed to dealing with the issues of deep indebtedness and mortgage arrears. But, but what I really would like to emphasize here is we sat down with professional um, consultants in an attempt in the 1990s to, to professionalize how the organization would focus the resources that it had and to make them uh, um, ultimately uh, more useful to the clients that we were trying to serve. And death was identified as an area that we needed to go off and get some specialization because people needed a service in that area. And Paul Joyce, who is still our senior policy analyst in the this evening, became that expert. And he and Stuart so that when it came to the crash in 2008, we did actually experience an incredible moment whereby so many government departments and agencies of the state all looked to our labor organization for expertise in an area now that had tens of thousands of people who were going into mortgage arrears and suffering massive indebtedness and who needed a legal, a legal route to alleviate the worst excesses of that indebtedness. And Paul ended up being a government appointed nominee on, on the expert group on personal debt and mortgage arrears. He was influential on the drafting of the vital code of conduct for uh, lenders on mortgage arrears and uh, his expertise and his credibility really then positioned Black in a, it, to be able to attract them funding and respect uh, and attention from government departments that it hadn't got at the same level uh, heretofore. And that uh, I do think it is something that the organisation can point to as having been the product of hard-headed uh, strategic planning. Because when you have, as that has 40,000 people a year really looking for advice, you just simply spend more time saying no than you just say saying yes. You can't have a lot of your organisation, you can't deal with the need that's out there. You have got to focus it and you've got to try and be effective with the resources that you have. And I do think that's a great uh, example of that. That is Paul welcoming then President Mary Robinson to a flag event. Now, Paul does leave the Republic, and that's as low as I've ever seen <laughs> in front of another human being. I think it's a little too low, Bella, uh, myself, <laughs> the Constitution of the Republic, but nonetheless, that's what he's engaged in. And there, well, about to welcome the President is then Chairperson Iso Domad. And Iso Domad has spent many years as a director of flag. And as a chairperson uh, of FLAG, and she is now Ms. Justice uh, Isol Domani uh, of the Supreme Court, and we're delighted she's uh, joining us this evening, in this with us this evening. But there you see FLAG used to uh, employ the methods of TV game shows, whereby the chairperson and the directors would wear a first name sticker on their, uh, on their head, and so you see there Isol on a sticker on her jacket. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the workings of the screen Court, I should just point out that they don't do that. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> they do not come out onto the bench with the first name sticker <laughs> when they are sitting on the screen Court. I don't know why, but <laughs> maybe sometime in the future. After that, and with what was eventually the money that was secured from the successful test cases that we had uh, indeed on the social welfare front, we were finally able to actually as an organisation buy a building. And I do believe, again, it's a sense of blessings to them, I have great belief in bricks and mortar for an organisation. There is nothing like having a physical building that is the home of your organisation. And also it's a physical building for people to come to. And once you have a presence, a permanent presence, if you own a building, as we then did, were able to do with that building in Dorset Street, uh, it, gives, it gives security security to your staff to show them that the organisation is there to stay, and it gives a sense of security to the people who are coming to use your service. 
that you aren't going in for. And that then resulted in an explosion in our ability to have professional staff. And you see there uh, the staff that uh, FLAC was able to employ during the, uh, during the uh, 2000s. The 2000s were an era when Catherine uh, Higgy uh, was a director who was on the screen right of that uh, uh, picture and she developed a new era of uh, professional fundraising for the organisation and you see of course in the middle you see Noli Blackwell who was a CEO for 10 years uh, able to deploy her incredible unique skills in being able to communicate extremely uncomfortable and difficult messages in, in an utterly comprehensible and relatable way. And the leadership that Adam and that Noli uh, employed at that point in time put Flan at the centre of extremely difficult debates and particularly after the crash in 2008. And it was a very crowded media field and a very crowded field uh, in which lots of people had lots of opinions about what might or might not happen. But building on the credibility that the organisation had and the expert work of the staff uh, which had preceded those uh, decades, uh, Noli was able to place flag at the heart of that national, um, at that national debate. Our communications under the directorship of Yvonne Woods uh, became utterly uh, professional and effective in a way that massively uh, influenced uh, how often flag's voice could get, uh, could get heard. Searsha Brady, led uh, an extremely expert legal research because the quality of legal research that was coming out of the organisation at that stage was completely dependent on the professionalisation of that staff. And it was a new, without question, uh, that leadership led Flat into a new era of, uh, of effectiveness as, a, as a, an NGO. And that then led to flexibility to attract funding <coughs> from Atlantic Philanthropies. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, this landscape, Atlantic Philanthropies foundation of Chuck Feeney. Chuck Feeney died a couple of months ago and was buried last Friday in the last Cemetery. century. He's an Irish-American man who was a billionaire and he set up a foundation for the disbursement of seven billion dollars of his personal wealth. He did that throughout the world but he focused on a number of countries in particular. Ireland was one of the countries he focused on. And he spent a huge amount of money in the health sector and in the education sector in this country. But he also spent it in civil society. And flat <coughs> beneficiary of that. Because it was a very uh, momentous happenstance that at the point when Captain and Lowy were leading uh, flat to a level of professionalization they hadn't had before they were able to sit in front of the Atlantic Foundation and present a credible case for greatly increased funding in the organisation. And the one thing you know about Atlantic Philanthropies is they did not hand out money easily. You had to go through the most rigorous vetting process and the most rigorous auditing process. And what became incredible then was the auditing was at the level of an organisation that we never had before. Because very often the people who were funding uh, an organisation like that wants to know how, uh, how many people do you serve or how many people have come in your doors. Atlantic Philanthropists would sit down in order and say, How many laws have we influenced this year? How much change have we actually affected? How many cases do you have in your books that might have an impact on the state of the law? And there was an annual, rigorous audit of how the organisation was actually performing according to its stated aims and goals. And I'm very uh, proud to say that that uh, auditing process secured funding from Atlantic right up to the point where it ceased. And it ceased because uh, Chuck Feeney had a uh, belief in only giving while living. And in fact, for a couple of years before he died, the funding ceased across the world. And that left a massive gap for the fact that it's had to fill. And I'm glad, to, so delighted to say so many people in this room have assisted filling that massive gap and trying to keep us at the level, <coughs> at the level of uh, expenditure <laughs> that we became accustomed to in the, uh, in the 2000s. We also then uh, had on staff uh, Michael Farrell, who as you know is a legendary uh, civil rights activist, uh, civil rights activist in the north, 
and who was at the core face of civil rights uh, activism at the grimmest time in this country's uh, history. But what is utterly unbelievable of Michael Farrell is that he never succumbed to the cynicism that you might think someone would have faced what he faced uh, in his career uh, might otherwise uh, fall foul. He actually retained a belief in the rule of law and retained a belief particularly in the rule of international human rights law that, he had, that has continued to this day. That found a great expression of his support for the Lydia Floyd case, which was a case that Michael worked on for 10 years, but was on flat books for 21 years. Lydia Floyd was a transgender woman who underwent gender reassignment surgery in the early 90s. She came to flat in 1996, and the file was opened in the flat office in 1996, where she was seeking to have her birth cert amended to reflect her gender as a woman. For 21 years, that file was open, and it resulted in two high court cases, the second of which resulted in the first declaration of incompatibility with an Irish law and the European Convention on Human Rights. It ultimately resulted in the Gender Recognition Act of 2015, and Lydia Foy ultimately, uh, at that time, with Michael, was secured uh, her birth certificate reflecting her uh, gender uh, as, a, as a woman. But the an uh, organisation was in a position then, through those decades, to take on a case like that and to deliver uh, what was, uh, for uh, Lydia, an incredibly difficult uh, victory because she suffered terrible abuse and could have been the, uh, the poster woman for transgenderism for as long as she was. Uh, um, but ultimately it was a successful uh, campaign and uh, it is reflective of the types of test cases that when they are successful and work well are the kinds of cases that flag can do because I do believe the building that we have is a building for cases to come that have nowhere else to go. And there are many cases that we've had over the decades that have nowhere else to go. People who have nowhere else to go with their case. And you can't do all of them, but you can do some of them. And if you do some of them well, you can be effective. Sinead Lucy now holds the role of um, Senior solicitor at Flag, and she runs specialist clinics uh, for the traveller community, specialist clinic for the Roma community. And it is hard to say that that is work at the hardest pull face uh, of, uh, of, of legal rights in, in this uh, country. She provides an incredible leadership role as a solicitor for the uh, expert staff we have. And she also runs an LGBTQ plus clinic. And some people think, well, how after 2015 do you still need an LGBTQ? clinic, a specialist clinic in this country. My answer to which is you only have to look at what the Russian Supreme Court did a couple of weeks ago when they declared the non-existent global LGBTQ movement to be an extremist organisation to see how you can take no progress on any front for granted. You have to constantly maintain uh, vigilance and you have to constantly fight for the rights of those uh, who are in uh, minorities. We did a plan for a long time campaign for Civil Legal Aid Scheme, and ultimately the government appointed a committee chaired by uh, former Chief Justice Frank Clark. Eilish has sat on that committee as a plant representative, and it will report next year. The two hundred reports have expanded State uh, Legal Aid Scheme, but also that it seeks a role for independent law centres. We're not the only independent law centres. Uh, thankfully, at this stage, there are others throughout the city and throughout the country. But we are, uh, I believe, a key uh, independent law centre, and we do. Uh, um, derive such support from throughout the legal um, profession, so many of whom have volunteered for FLAC or just support FLAC with um, financial uh, donations. The 40,000 calls that come in have to be managed. Uh, uh, Ingrid Colvin uh, and Eric Broke, Bro they manage the clinics and the phone lines in a way that attempts to ensure that the massive demand that's on our organisation is in some way, uh, is in some way met. But what we have uh, been able to do is to attempt to tap into the goodwill that does exist throughout the profession. The PILA project, that's the Public Interest Law Alliance project in fact launched and has been there for many years, has introduced a pro bono work in law offices throughout the country. A huge number of the biggest law offices, solicitor's offices, in Dublin and throughout the country now have signed up to the pro bono pledge to commit to a certain amount of free legal work every year. And that's a massive contribution to meeting on men. Uh, legal needs in the country. We've also had uh, amazing support from the bar throughout our existence. And barristers and solicitors, people who do not know this, I think they should know, 
that uh, every barrister solicitor in their subscription, their professional subscription rate makes a subscription to that. Uh, and it's just it's an astonishing uh, ability, it's an astonishing contribution on behalf of the profession to uh, meeting the needs of those who cannot afford, afford the services of private practitioners. And that, on, on top of that, is the willingness of barristers and solicitors to do cases for free when they are, uh, when they are asked. And for all of the negative uh, feeling and publicity there is towards uh, uh, the legal profession generally, and how it's the butt of so many often well-deserved jokes, uh, it's a, it's a well-paid profession that very often has some of the well-known people in the country as its members. But it's still a pretty astonishing situation, I believe, in this country, and one that we can be rightly proud of, that it is a profession that has absolutely stood up to the challenge of contributing to what many people need in this, in this country. And solicitors have been there from the start, and the bar has been there from the start, and I put one picture up of Frank Cannon, because uh, Frank Cannon uh, is a barrister who died two years ago today, Picture there with Katrina Crow at an event where we delivered a talk on Joyce and the Law, and that was, of course, his great passion and his combination of that passion and transformation work. Frank, when he died, was actually leading a legal team in a case for Flan. An incredibly difficult case for his client. Uh, there was a man with Down syndrome who wished to marry his girlfriend with Down syndrome and became the subject of a high court injunction to prevent the marriage going ahead, which ultimately uh, led to Frank having to pursue a case to challenge the war chief towards the jurisdiction of the High Court. Uh, that's a case that uh, in fact still is in, it, uh, it is in being. But what Frank did, for those of you who might know, he adopted in the best traditions of the bar, a literally fearless commitment to the cause of his client in that case. Uh, and he, did, he, he gave of his own in circumstances where he was never going to be uh, paid uh, for it. And he, I just uh, I shared that picture because of the uh, uh, the fact that it is his anniversary and he was a beloved friend of so many of us uh, in this room that uh, it's, an, it's an appropriate example of that contribution. And that <coughs> Atlantic funding, by with all the other funding, led to uh, Flank's ability to move to this headquarters, which is now uh, is, uh, uh, resident in Mondor Street. It's a former bank building, it's on the and uh, it's on the side of the uh, birthplace actually of Sean Casey. Whenever there's an event there, I just try to reach point into a spot on the floor and it says Sean Casey was born there. Expect to see sort of one side of the stage or something like that. Sean Casey was born there uh, in, that, uh, in, the, in the tenement that was on that, uh, or in a building in fact that was on that site before it became a bank and it is now in our uh, headquarters. And uh, I am, uh, to like to say, that's a modern uh, office building that meets the needs of a, a, a modern uh, staff and it is thanks, as I say, to the support of so many uh, here that it is uh, a, a commodious and appropriate headquarters now for an organisation that, uh, that isn't going to go away and is not going to uh, hopefully for a long time suffer the precarious fate uh, that the student protest saved from in 1992. The ultimate legal change that one can effect if we are involved uh, in attempting legal change in this country is to the fundamental uh, law of the state, and that is by way of constitutional uh, uh, amendment. The staff of the uh, flag at present, and some of them are uh, represented in, uh, in, that, uh, in that forum, and they have uh, been engaged in constitutional amendment campaigns in the lawyers of change during the uh, recent uh, campaigns for marriage equality in 2015 and appeal uh, the 8th of 2018 and uh, say more perhaps the proposed uh, constitution uh, changes next March at the present. But changing the constitution is a, uh, is a very momentous thing and it's a very uh, significant uh, act to engage in, in a country. The 1980s were particularly grim because grim for those of us of particular persuasion because 1983 was the time when the Eighth Amendment was introduced by vote and 1986 was the first divorce referendum where it was uh, roundly defeated. But in the 1990s uh, things changed and the 1995 uh, divorce referendum uh, was I think uh, something of a turning point. 
And one of the great lessons about the constitutional campaign, if it's the right campaign and if it's the right moment, is that it puts together an alliance of people who agree with the proposal, and that brings together people who otherwise might not agree on politics at all. In fact, they might not agree on many issues in politics, but they come together for one issue and for one campaign. And that's a very unique thing uh, about uh, Ireland's experience of constitutional referendums. And we do have, I think, the good fortune to have a constitution that is readily, easily, relatively easily amendable, and also that they can produce the kind of momentous states that we experience. And I know that many of us experience the joy of the Marriage Equality Day. It was an incredible day to be alive in Dublin. It was an incredible day to be in the centre of Dublin and to feel part of a republic that was growing up. But that day, likewise that day in 2018, when we repealed the A, that was an incredible feeling of people come together after effecting some of the change to actually be part of something that important and that fundamental. And back in 95, uh, I learned the first lessons of how important it is to bring an effective alliance together and how you have to be, again, hard-headed about people have got to come together and put aside their political differences or their personal differences and be absolutely committed to the goal of getting to 50% plus one because that's what gets you victory in a referendum campaign. And in 1995, I, in the debate that David referred to, the last televised debate in questions and answers chaired by John Bowman, I found myself as part of that alliance seated beside uh, none other than Minister Michael Noonan. <laughs> <laughs> now, Michael Noonan was good enough not to mention anything about the last time <laughs> that he and I had conversed on matters of political. <laughs> but we went into that debate united and we were faced with two representatives of the uh, Vote No campaign, one of whom was a retired type of judge. It had come out in the papers just before that uh, debate that some money was coming from conservative organisations in the United States into the uh, anti divorce campaign. And Michael Newman started off with the TV debate by saying, uh, I hear you're getting money from uh, America. And he started to chide the, the, the judge in particular. And he said, is it the Michigan militia? Is it the Michigan militia that's giving you the money? <laughs> and it became quite tense after that. It was tense enough to start it. But it was quite tense um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the debate itself. But I knew I was part of a new alliance in Irish politics when we left the studio and Michael leaned over and conspiratorially whispered to me and said, I know I might have come across as a bit aggressive. But I thought it was important to take the judge out early. <laughs> now, I think that was a little bit of monster rugby <laughs> being introduced uh, into the political arena, or perhaps it was just a very firm grasp of the separation powers. <laughs> <laughs> Those alliances that can come together did come together with a really professional way that the marriage equality campaign was run and ended up being uh, uh, a resounding win over 60% for it and over 60% for the repeal, uh, for repeal the aid. But what's important to, to understand about those constitutional campaigns is that they are ones in which there wasn't just a recognition of people who might have felt isolated or marginalised or needed to be included. You didn't just recognise the fact that uh, our LGBT community was a uh, part of our uh, community and deserved of uh, equality like everyone else. You weren't just recognising that people, that women uh, wanted to have control of their bodies and wanted to have the right to terminate. Uh, pregnancy, you conferred a right, and each of those amendments conferred a right as well as recognising the community. And therefore, when the campaigns were looking at that, they could see the benefit of the result. It wasn't just going to be a provision that said hello to a certain group, it was going to actually confer something by way of benefit. And that's the concern that I had about the proposals for the constitutional amendments uh, 
uh, that are going to be voted on next March. There's no question but that the outdated sexist language about uh, women's work in the home has to be uh, expunged from the Constitution, and that's something that uh, very few would want, uh, would want to retain. But likewise, there's an extended definition of the family being proposed, where it will be uh, defined in the, con the family will be defined in the Constitution as an institution based on marriage or other durable relationships. Now, what other durable relationships might be? The examples that have been given by the government include families headed by a lone parent or a grandparent or a guardian. I don't think it's entirely clear yet what exactly, what exactly everyone is going to have to say about the, the definition of a durable relationship or how exactly the expanded definition of the family, if this amendment passes, is going to have any practical or real impact. I think the areas of taxation, social welfare, inheritance, but certainly I don't believe they have been fully debated as of yet. They haven't been set out uh, in any detail. And then when we get to the provision of carers, the proposal uh, is that the new article put into the Constitution would say the state recognises that the provision of care by members of the family to one another by reason of the bonds that exist among them gives to society a support without which the common good cannot be achieved and shall strive to support such a provision. Now, that strive to support has replaced a recommendation of both the Joint Office Committee on Gender Equality and the Constitutional <coughs> Convention excuse me, to have a, a harder a, a, a provision that would actually confer a benefit and would put an obligation on the uh, on, the, on their state to take reasonable measures to support the care. So the option of obliging the state to, to take reasonable measures to support care, I, I think has been rejected because it felt that that might give rise to a concrete benefit and might give rise to people claiming an entitlement and a right as a result of the amendment. So what is being proposed is a pullback from that, and I think that will lead to there's already been some negative commentary on that carer's provision, uh, and I do think that that could well turn out to be a difficult debate because certainly the role of carers in our society is massively underappreciated and it is certainly under supported by the state. Uh, and it does not appear to me that that constitutional amendment is going to have a concrete benefit if it is, uh, if it is passed. So, uh, I think there are positive elements in the proposals for next March, but I think there are other elements that will lead people to feel uh, disappointed. Because the one thing that you want in a constitutional referendum that is uh, going to be ultimately a defining moment in progressing our republic, you want clarity of purpose around what it is that is hoped to be achieved. Then you need clarity of wording and you need as much certainty as you can get that that wording will deliver the goal that you're seeking to achieve. Then you have to put together an alliance that can withstand all of the rigours of a full-blown amendment campaign and get it over the line. And what you've seen in the United Kingdom in 2016 Brexit, which had over 60% support the year before the vote uh, and ultimately was uh, defeated 52 48. What you've seen in October uh, in Australia with the Voice for Aboriginal uh, Peoples Parliament vote, which had almost 70% support uh, uh, last year in opinion polls, was defeated 60 40 in Australia. It shows how incredibly effective a no campaign is against a positive, what well, seems to be a positive proposal with widespread support. And those two moments in those two countries have been out being the Brexit and in Australia with the Indigenous Peoples uh, referendum were huge disappointments to progressives in those countries. And they were massive defeats. And what you have to do with a constitutional campaign is be really clear at the end about what you are hoping to achieve and what exactly the uh, goal is. And it's for that that I come to the final proposal that was part of the programme for 
was to hold a housing referendum. And that looks like it's not going to happen. But there won't be a housing referendum. But what there is on the current MP is a housing crisis. And it's a crisis that actually crosses all the socioeconomic uh, barriers at this stage because the middle class now are looking at their children and feeling that they might not be able to house themselves in the way that the middle class traditionally could. There was always a housing uh, problem uh, for people who were impoverished and on the margins. But what the government proposed in its programme for government was a housing, uh, a housing referendum, and it looks like they are not going ahead of that, despite the fact that the Housing Commission has done a massive amount of good work. And a huge body of legal opinion has been gathered, some of it by people who are here uh, this evening, and constitutional experts have come together to actually grapple with the issue of how a housing amendment could help in the housing crisis. It's not going to be a panacea, it's not a solution, and nobody's talking about a housing uh, uh, provision that provides a right to an individual house for every person who wants one in the state. But what we have had traditionally is the Article 40 and the Article 43 guarantees to deal with the housing crisis. And therefore, significant proposals to tackle the housing crisis have been met with the argument that that's unconstitutional because of the constitutional breach of the uh, provisions uh, guaranteeing the right to private property. That's an argument that can play out in the Supreme Court. For, for decades to come. There's a good enough reason to stop that, and a good enough reason is put an amendment into the Constitution that uh, prevents uh, uh, proposals to tackle that as devices being scuppered because of the threat of, uh, of a constitutional challenge on those grounds. That's a good enough reason in my view to have them there. But what's interesting is, in fact, most of the, of the constitutional experts who gave expert opinions to the Housing Commission were of the view that a right to adequate housing is something that could be and should be put into the Constitution itself. I do, I do not for a second think that the housing uh, issue is easy in this country. Uh, I spent seven years chairing the Avenue Gardens Regeneration Board and managed to build precisely not one house. The Avenue Gardens flat complex is one of the grimmest flat complexes city, it's on a 14 acre site, we have beside the uh, Phoenix Park, and we had a hugely detailed plan for a mixed development, regeneration of that site with social housing, affordable housing, and private housing in, in, in a, a mix. We had a board that came together with representatives of residents of the flats. The residents were all the women, they were all those women who were incredibly committed to getting a better future for their children, incredibly committed to the prospect of uh, transforming the community, which they did. They had incredible uh, efforts uh, made that were fruitful in building trust with the representatives of the local community who sat on that board. And we sat for seven years building up that trust and incredible relations with councillors, Dublin City Council officials, representatives of state agencies like the HC and on Garden Shikana. And we came together in an incredible combination of, uh, of, of persons and skills to try and uh, transform a community that was pretty devastated. But because, as you can see from the days that it existed, it, 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 um, it, it operated right in the middle of the property crash and the economic crash. So I just have the time to go into the wise awareness as to why exactly that uh, generation scheme collapsed. Um, but one little lesson again, I'll come back to it from the beginning, which was a number of years before we did dissolve the board, it was apparent that the, uh, that the plan was, was uh, effectively going to be suffered. Two uh, uh, of the women who represented the residents of the flats asked to see me privately uh, in my office. And they came to see me and to sit down to express their fear that the board was going to be dissolved. And I said, when I had a frank conversation with the residents, I said, but you can see what's happened. You can see the difficulties that we're facing. It does not look as if this is going to happen. They were absolutely heartbroken because this, their kids were growing up in front of them. Uh, during the period that they thought they were going to be in brand new houses and they were still living in, in very uh, grim circumstances. And I said, well, I, I honestly, I said, if I thought it was going to come uh, good, I'd stick with it. And they said, no, we don't understand. Of course we know the project is doomed. But this is the first occasion that we've been part of a forum where we have access to officials of the public city council, officials of the agency, members of the Garrison where we're engaged in dialogue with our uh, neighbouring communities and where we're listened to and respected. And we don't want that to happen. 
Because if you let the board to be dissolved, we're going to be left where we start and we're going to feel utterly abandoned. And it was quite the moment for me because, again, I was, I was so busy being concerned about what the house was going to be built that I took up the basic lesson that I thought I had learned in the 1980s, which is you can never underestimate the importance of connection with people who feel marginalized. You can never underestimate the importance of listening to people and respecting them. And you can never underestimate the importance of every act and every manifestation of support for people who are on uh, the margins. For those of you who have heard me do this uh, before in terms of relying on uh, Patrick uh, Kavanagh, um, I, uh, uh, I apologise uh, in advance because uh, but I don't, I don't know of any better manifestation in the poet of thought, poetic wisdom to try and capture the, uh, the, the sense of the importance of the uh, inclusion and the connectivity that I've tried to, uh, that I've tried to convey. And before I come to that, I do want to make a point that I understand that the constitutional amendments are not the, uh, are not the be all and the end all, and legal uh, campaigns of that nature are not the be all and the end all. Uh, but Tonight I'm just attempted to focus on the work of so many lawyers in the flag, uh, so many uh, volunteers, so many people who sat on the uh, on the board of the flag for years, the likes of uh, uh, Joanne Hyde, the Don uh, Crew, and Judy Hurley, who have sat with me for uh, for decades now uh, on the board of the flag. I've spoken about some of the chairpersons uh, and uh, some of the connections that we have into the profession have been utterly enriched of the lives, I believe, of all of us who have worked together in this regard. But I do believe in polit party political activity because at the end of the day it's the Oireachtas that has to legislate. The Oireachtas has to legislate uh, if we're going to have a full republic. The Oireachtas has to pass laws that make people more included. The Oireachtas ultimately has to pass the laws that tackle the housing crisis. I just want to make it clear I'm not in any way suggesting that that isn't the heart of the realm. I'm just looking at another part of it right now. And I very much am an utter believer in, uh, in the importance of party politics in a democracy uh, such, as, uh, such as ours. I was very proud to be uh, Alex White's election agent in the Labour Party uh, for most of his uh, political uh, for most of his political career. And to have our current party leader, Ivana Bajit, join us this evening along with other uh, members of the Oireachtas. Uh, but it was just tonight I wanted to focus on those lessons that I think can be learned when we come together as a community around an organisation that attempts to focus on unmet need and attempts to manage and deal with that need as effectively as it can in the environment uh, of, uh, of today. And that is, I believe, an incredible amount of goodwill and support from so many people in this room, an incredible amount of goodwill uh, across the entire uh, profession and across our stakeholders. That gives me incredible options. There's nothing that would inspire you as much as listening to young lawyers talk about how they want to get involved in cases and want to get involved uh, in meeting one that they need to give you such great hope for the future. Which is why I do go back to Patrick Kavanagh in his poem, uh, Epic. Uh, where he expresses his doubts about uh, writing about the local neighbour just in between the Duffins and the Caves over a sliver of land when much more important things were happening in the world with the rise uh, of the threat uh, of Nazi Germany. And he says, Which was more important? I inclined to lose my faith in Ballyrush and Horton till Homer's ghost came whispering to my mind. He said, I may be Iliad from such a local row. Gods make their own words. Gods make their own words.